with everyone. Yes, I'm recording now. Got it. Would you need to share the screen or anything? Oh, no, so unless me. you want to see me, I can I can put on the video, but <laughs> ask them. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, yeah, there's no, it's more, um, you know, and you guys are welcome to also show yourselves. I don't know. You, I think it's, is it, oh, there, there's me. Hi, everyone. Nice Hello. to see you all. Oh, my lighting's not great. This is my office at Mass General. And um, so someday, hopefully, you'll be in this position as well. And that's the whole point of this talk to kind of, you know, introduce you to the idea of being able to come to the States, what it requires, what some of the pitfalls are, some of the barriers that are not fair, but they are what they are, just so that you know them. Um, and then what really a systematic step by step move is in order to actually come to the States. So um, I do know uh, Dr. Malik, of course, and um, we talked a little bit about what this group is. So I know that there are people from varying backgrounds. Some of you are already surgeons. You know, Some of you are trying to, to come here after doing some initial training. And so um, I will say right now that the climate specifically for surgery, it's always been challenging, but it is a little bit extra challenging. The reason for that is because um, they have, they opened a bunch of other medical schools in the States, which, so it's kind of stupidity on their part because <laughs> basically we now have all of these medical schools, but, um, not necessarily the positions that, um, every person could want. But the good thing about it is unlike the British system, which sort of runs like a, you know, there's a set number of consultant positions. And if people are in those consultant positions, you basically have to wait for someone to die before you can get their job. That's not the way the States is at the end of the day the states is a business and so you want to do any type of surgery you can you can become an orthopedic surgeon a vascular surgeon or whatever and you know and the likelihood is there'll be a job for you so that's actually a very positive thing of course about the about the states the other beauty of america which has been from its inception to the day you know to today is that it is truly the land of opportunity i've um i'm indian by background i um have lived in uh, Scotland for a decent proportion of my life. Um, and I uh, uh, was in Muscat Oman for a little while and then came to the States with my family. And I really can tell you, you know, and I've traveled extensively that truly this philosophy that they have about everybody really gets a chance and, you know, they really try to give you a fair shake. And if you're good, you'll make it is actually very true. That's not just, uh, and I'm sorry, by the way, they're just talking to me about my, my patients. Um, so, so basically, to introduce myself, my name is Anaita Dua. I am a vascular surgeon. I did my um, general surgery residency um, in the Medical College of Wisconsin, which is a five-year residency. And then I did two years of postdoctoral research fellowship down in Houston. And then I did my vascular surgery training at Stanford and then now work at Mass General and Harvard and have been working here for the last few years. Um, so I have traveled all over the place. I did, like, as I mentioned, I did medical school in Scotland. So I am a foreign medical graduate myself. And so I can talk to you a little bit about that and uh, even things like the visa process and whatnot. So that's wonderful. I'm sure yeah. they'll be interested in knowing that. No, good, good. No, that, that's important. You know, I mean, yes. there's no point in sugarcoating anything. If you're going to make this journey, it's a big deal. So it's, it's a big expense. It's a big deal. It's psychologically disturbing. So, you know, it takes, it encompasses your whole life. And so you want to have the best chance of making it if you go down this path. And the best kind of, you know, ammunition that I can give you to potentially make it is um, have the knowledge, right? Know what, I mean, the days are gone where you just need to get a 270 on the USMLE and there's going to be a job somewhere. That doesn't happen anymore. In fact, the USMLEs have gone to pass fail now. So they're no longer um, graded. So it's even taken away that little advantage that foreign medical graduates had um, of being able to do exceptionally well on the test and then being wanted or sought after. And uh, there are a variety of reasons that they, they chose to do that. But, but the fact is that now they have done that. So let's talk about the journey. So what happens to become a surgeon in the United States? Um, it depends, I'll say, first of all, on what type of surgeon you want to be. If you want to be a vascular surgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, a plastic surgeon, or a CT surgeon, right? You uh, can go directly from medical school into a track that can be anywhere from five to seven years of direct training. And after that, you um, uh, can start working as an attending. The most 
common way that people do it, those they go through general surgery training. So you finish medical school. After medical school, you do five years of dedicated general surgery training that encompasses all of the things I just mentioned, except for neurosurgery and uh, orthopedic surgery. That's its own track. And you basically do rotations over this five-year period of time. And um, in that period of time, you're called a resident. And after you complete that, if you choose to go into vascular, choose to go into cardiothoracic or plastics or whatever, you want to do extra training, then it's usually two to three years beyond that five years in a dedicated fellowship about that particular topic. So as I mentioned, I did general surgery five years at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I did my vascular surgery fellowship at Stanford. So um, you would choose to do it that way. So the first step in most of your journeys is going to be getting a general surgery residency. That's what you're going to need to do. The United States does not give any value at all to anyone else's training, um, no matter who you are. And, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because they're equal to everybody. It's not like, oh, you come from Canada, we're going to let you skip and go directly to being uh, attending. They make everybody start from, from scratch. On the other hand, that's very bad because if you worked for 20 years, now you have to go and start over again. But you know that's the price that you do pay. So, um, and five years in the scheme of things is actually not that much time. Also remember, you are getting paid in those five years. So technically it is a job. You are working in a job. So it's not like I'm just in training, I'm doing this for free. It's not like medical school. So how do you actually get into that position? Well, there are the first um, step in being able to secure a United States residency is ideally being able to show that you have some experience in the United States for rotations. There are a number of schools like Harvard, Stanford, places like that, unfortunately very expensive, but they do allow you to come and do a what's called a sub-I or a sub-internship where you come and you do a medical rotation with the surgical team. So if we've got a sub I from Harvard, they actually come and join us for two months and you know they're just our student on the service. And at the end of it, we write a recommendation letter and that recommendation letter goes in their packet to move forward. Now, the problem that some of you will face is that the sub internship is really only available to people who are already in medical school. If you've graduated, you no longer are allowed to do a sub internship. Then the only thing that you could possibly do is an observership where you would be unable to actually put your hands on patients. Now, let's get a little bit into the visa aspect of things. There is a, an option for somebody who is trained, who wants to do a fellowship. So let's say that you are a general surgeon in Britain, okay? And you want to do extra cardiothoracic training in transplant, heart transplant. Duke University has a fellowship in that. You could apply for that, and essentially you would apply with a J-1 visa. So the J-1 means, of course, that you have to leave after you finish your time with, with them, even though you are um, a student. So it's a little bit strange because you are a student, so you should be on like you know some type of student visa, but you're not. They, they put it under this because they consider it a job that you are working. And, um, and that is a way to kind of circumvent not being able to do sub-internships. Because if you're in a position, and I can help you guys individually, I'm, you know, after I give you the, kind of this global talk, I'll have somebody share my email and we can communicate directly because each of your individual journeys will require specific focus. Um, you guys are not all going to be the same. And I'm happy to kind of guide where you should be and what you should be doing based on your, your own journey. But as a, as a rule, that is one way to circumvent it. So pretty much anything that I tell you, if it's like, oh crap, I can't do that, almost certainly there's an, a way around it that I can show you. Um, but again, it's gonna cost money. These sub-internships all cost money. They can cost anywhere from five to $10,000 per sub-I. And ideally you wanna have three. Actually, that's the magic number, because that allows you to um, have enough letters of recommendation to be able to put in your application for residency. So how does that work? Basically, once you have uh, done these following steps, taken the USMLE and passed it, not just step one, but step one, step two, and step three for foreign medical graduates. Why? Because Usually for American graduates, they can take step one and step two and they're secure because when they take, when they start residency in their first year, they take step three to get their final boards. But for foreign medical graduates, most places will not want to take you unless they know for sure that you have passed the USMLE step one, step two, and step three. Because the problem is if for any reason you come and you start working and you don't pass step three, you cannot advance to the second year of residency. So it kind of screws the program. So they just say, you know what? 
if there are enough graduates that are foreign that take these step three, I'm just going to pick from that group. So the USMLE are the board, essentially the board exams, um, very easy, frankly speaking. You, um, uh, the, the way really to study for them is through USMLE World. I think that's the, the best um, uh, algorithm. And it takes approximately two months to study for step one, about a month and a half to study for step two, and step three, about another two months. The key is that, um, as I said, you know, they've gone to pass fail as a model, but if you were scored, the, the key is that you wanna keep your scores going up, up, up. So step one, whatever your score is, step two should be higher, step three should be higher still. Um, beyond your USMLEs, you do have some basic requirements that the US will demand as um, equivalent to their medical school before they can take you on. So this is going to come down to individually each of you and where you went to medical school, even if it's 20 years ago, because there are some medical schools in the world that are not, um, uh, not uh, considered real by the US. And again, this is not my opinion. This is just right or wrong. And um, they therefore would not recognize your degree from that medical school. It is unlikely though, the States is pretty open. Actually, they're more open. My cousin went to medical school in Tanzania and India, where, where he's from, did not recognize his Tanzanian degree, but the United States did. And he actually now works in Vegas. So, you know, you just have to know um, you know who your what your medical school is and be able to provide transcripts. Now that's another problem. Um, in some places, medical school it's hard to get those transcripts, especially if you're living in a different state. But you have to be able to get your hands on the entirety of them because then the U.S. will actually take those transcripts and convert them to their equivocal um, uh, like allotment, and then they can determine whether or not you have any uh, courses that are outstanding. But most of you, if you finish medical school, the likelihood is that your requirements for a residency will be met by your medical school transcript. Um, so USMLE, transcript. Next thing that you need are those letters of recommendation or those sub I letters. They're not just letters that somebody, you know, gives you in your hand. The way that it works is when it comes time to apply for surgery residency. So let's say that you want to apply for surgery residency for this coming year, you would need to make your application the year prior. So right now, we are interviewing people for the vascular surgery residency at Harvard for them to start. Like we just did an interview round two days ago with the plan that they will know where they're coming to the match in March. And then they will start with us in August. So pretty much you have to have all of your paperwork in almost a whole 12 months prior to the date that you may be starting, which means that you have to really prepare about two and a half years in advance. So it's, it's significant time thinking, but it can be done. A lot of people have done it. Um, what what uh, I mean by thinking about it is there is a, uh, a good thing. There is a, a centralized application service called ERAS. And through ERAS, you make you basically go online and ERAS is spelled E-R-A-S. You go online and you have uh, to upload your transcript to them. You have to upload your USMLE scores to them. You have to upload your a couple of letters, like a dean's letter from your medical school and other things. And they tell you it basically if you don't have those equivocal things in your medical school, they will tell you what to do to, to uh, match to, to whatever they need. And then they need you to up, uh, basically request letters of recommendation from two to three people, depending on what specialty you're applying for. So you fill out this huge application. It's got like multiple tabs, your demographics, where you went to medical school, what your activities that you do, what publications you have, what presentations you've done, what social work you've done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a huge application. But it's very easy to follow, prompt, 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 and you'll be able to fill it out. And then there's usually a uh, one page um, essay that you need to write about why you want to be a surgeon or why you want to be particularly, you know, involved in, in that particular discipline, vascular surgery, orthopedic, whatever. And then when you hit enter on your EROS application and it's complete, basically an email goes to the two or three letter writers that you wanted to have upload letters and they have to actually upload the letters themselves to the EROS application. So you never put your hands on those letters. Most of the time you don't even see the letters. So they're usually blinded. Once that, and, and there, there are very clear submission deadlines. So for example, this past year, the EROS submission where everything needed to be complete, all the stuff you did, the letters from your letter writers and all of the paperwork that needs to come from your medical school and your USMLE completion, all had to be basically done by September of this year. 
Okay. Then interviews go out from the programs over the next few months. Most of the programs will take between two to three months to review your application. And then they send an invitation to interview. The good thing about interviewing these days is everything is via Zoom. So that's great because it's going to save you tons of money. In the past, people had to physically fly to these locations and you're talking four or $5,000 per time because you got to get the flights, you have to get the hotel, everything you have to pay for. They don't pay for anything. So, so this is fabulous. So now you can apply widely to any program that you want and have as many interviews as possible. The negative thing about it is ERAS is a money-making thing in that what happens is you have a base amount. And I, for me, it was like in the hundreds, but, but you have like some base amount that you pay that allows you to, uh, to apply to up to like 20 places. But if you want to apply to more than that, then it's a few hundred dollars per place or, you know, whatever amount of money per place. Sorry, just one second, guys. Um, sorry. Um, That's okay. Dr. Dua, can you write the link in the chat? For, uh, for, for Iras? Iras, yes. Um, one second, let me get it. Yes, once you're free, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Of course. There. So this just tells you, Thank you know, you. a little bit about how it's done, of course. And, and ERAS is very clear about what they want. So this is like the right place to start to know what the deadlines are and what the requirements are. And then you sort of work backward, you know, to say, okay, this is what I need to do to achieve my dream of becoming a surgeon. And we'll get to that part of it in just a few minutes. But um, so, so once you've applied through ERAS, so let's pretend that you have all of your paperwork done, all of your transcripts uploaded. And by the way, for foreign medical grads, okay, there is something called the ECFMG. Um, one second, I'm just going to put this also. Maybe with that, they'll be familiar, but still, yeah, send them. What, so, sorry, say that again? ECFMG, e maybe they will be familiar with that, but still yes. send them, yes. Yeah, 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 yes. no problem. I mean, and the reason I send this link is because you will need an ECFMG hmm. certificate to be able to apply. So if as a foreign medical grad, you'll have to put your certificate as part of your packet in the ERAS. And in order to get that certificate, you basically have to take the USMLEs and you have to go to an accredited medical school. So ECFMG certification is kind of the prelude to applying to ERAS because ERAS sees the ECFMG certificate and says, yes, this is a person that went to a legitimate medical school that the US recognizes and that they've taken the USMLE exams and they've, they've passed. And that's all they care about. So a lot of times with the ECFMG certificate, it's nice for you to be, you, to be able to get step three also done, everything done, got the certificate, and, and then you just upload and then you don't have to do anything. So, so you, you will be required as a foreign medical grad to have that certificate. So you know, it's nice to look at both of these things together. Once you've applied, so let's say September 1st, you've put in your application completely, you've hit submit, then the schools will get in contact with you via email and tell you, okay, you got an interview or not. So that's kind of the first round. Did you get an interview? Interviews are conducted over the course of the whole day with multiple attendings from that institution. So via Zoom, what you would do probably is you'd have like three to four attendings that you would, uh, att attendings are consultants like me that you would have to talk to throughout the day. And basically you would meet um, on, uh, no, unfortunately not, uh, MR, sorry, I'm just saying this, MRCS is not accepted, unfortunately. Alone, and that's, alone but maybe with uh, the background of their education, it would be. No. Like if they're already highly qualified from their, uh, if no, already, unfortunately not. No, not even they that. It's, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, they, it's just a, what will happen is if you do a resident, so, so if you get into fellowship here, so if you do MRCS, right, and you then apply to do a post fellowship in, uh, you know, vascular, endovascular advanced stuff, you, you, you then can work as a doctor in the state, like you've made it, you, you've gotten in, that's your back door in, but you need to do some training as the base. And most of the time they won't, it's very, there are, there are very few, uh, there's one residency, for example, actually it's a fellowship. It's not a residency. There's a fellowship in Houston, for example, that is an advanced aortic surgery. And they specifically target foreign medical graduates. Um, the last one, a friend of mine, she's from Israel. And so she came, she did her fellowship. So she did, she was a doctor already in Israel working as an, as a aortic surgeon. 
She then applied and got this fellowship, came to the U.S., did her one year of aortic advanced training in Houston, and then they hired her as faculty. So that's one way to, to do it. During that fellowship, was she allowed to uh, participate in the surgery? Or yes, she totally. only had to she watch it? No, no, no. She was completely allowed to participate. She was like a regular fellow. Like you wouldn't know she was uh, from anywhere. And for, in order to do fellowships, uh, do they have to do USMLE? Yes, that is mandatory. Must. Yeah, must. There is no way around the USMLE. That is an absolute board. That's the Amer that's that's got nothing to do actually with the medical institution. That has to do with the government. That the the USMLEs are board exams. What and that is why it went to pass fail because at the end of the day, you know, the doctor started saying, well, if our candidates are taking the exam anyway, let's use their score to determine who's smart and who's dumb, and that has a lot of problems with it because as a lot of foreign graduates know you know we do Kaplan and this and that and you can study for the exam and do very well doesn't necessarily mean that you know someone who didn't do so well is dumb also like you know there are a lot of people that don't have that much money and so they don't have like thousands of dollars to spend on all these extra tuition and this and that and so they may not do as well but it's not because they're dumb or they shouldn't get a chance it's just because of this discrepancy in you know privilege pretty much and then the the other the other thing is you know it made no sense to give it a number because it is just the board exams if you pass them then you are at the level that is acceptable to work as a physician in the United States so it really is binary either you are or you're not and so that's why it went to pass fail which is a, again a blessing and a curse sort of for the foreign medical graduate community um, but that is the reason why you have to take it because it's a legal thing it's not a medical thing the U.S. licensing board requires the U.S. MLEs. No way around it. So, so um, once uh, once you've applied and you've had your interview, then it's a waiting game. At that point, basically, you wait for two to three months because it is usually March time that they do something called the match. The match is basically after you've interviewed. Let's say you've interviewed at three programs. Okay, you interviewed at Hopkins, Stanford, and Harvard. So you like these three programs, but you like Stanford the best. So you put Stanford number one. You liked Harvard. You put Harvard number two. You put Hopkins number three. The programs also will rank you. They will interview like 40 people and they'll say, yep, you know, I really like this person. They're number one in my program. Stanford may put you number five. Harvard may put you number one. Hopkins may put you number 10. And then what happens is there's this, you both enter your match list. You don't know what they're doing. They don't know what you're doing. You enter it into this on the day that you have to submit your rank list. That's what it's called. And then you wait. And in March, on like March 9th or whatever, you find out where you matched and you'll just get one name. So your, your, your email will tell you, yes, you matched, congratulations, or no, you didn't match, which is obviously unfortunate. If you have matched within two days of that, it'll tell you, you matched to this location. And it'll just give you that one place, it'll say Stanford. It won't tell you where you ranked with Hopkins. It won't tell you anything, but frankly, you know, whatever it is, great, right? And then, awesome, you celebrate heavily and you start working in July, which then, you know, you've made it into the system. Once you break into the system, the U.S. is very good about taking care of their own. They're very good about ensuring that once you're in the system, you get a fantastic education, world-class surgical, um, you know, structured learning. And one of the beauties of this system, which I was talking about with Samreen, is that it is finite. So unlike the British system that can go on and on and on, you know, you do your five years of under training, then you do a registrar, then you have to find a consultant job. But if you don't find a consultant job, then you're not a consultant, you just keep being a registrar. That's not the way it works in the States. And the way in the States is it's a finite program, five years general surgery, two years, three years fellowship, you're done, you're an attending. Whether you work a day in your life is your problem. You are an attending vascular surgeon. Um, you can't continue to be a fellow. You can't be a fellow for another six years. It doesn't work like that. Um, and the reason is because, again, it's a business model and there are jobs. So, you know, the likelihood is you'll graduate and there'll be ample jobs uh, available to you. So some of the pitfalls and barriers in terms of being a foreign graduate. Number one, they want to obviously, you know, foster their own people who will go to the United States medical schools. In the hierarchy of things, obviously, U.S. citizens or green card holders who also go to U.S. schools get priority. Uh, most of the time, followed by foreign medical graduates that are U.S. green card holders or citizens. Then comes the next category, which is people who are, and, and by the way, you can be a U.S. citizen, but 
gone to medical school in Pakistan and live in Pakistan, but if you're a US citizen, you get the benefit of being a US citizen. But most of us fall into the category of not a US citizen and in a foreign medical school. And the rungs of the totem pole, that is the lowest one. But that doesn't mean anything. There are multiple, multiple, really senior, very respected, amazing people that have made the US medical world like top notch, number one, that are foreign medical graduates from everywhere, Poland, Pakistan, India, you know, you know, Africa, you, you name it, you know, and they're amazing. And so, so everybody knows somebody who's a foreign medical graduate and who's incredible and usually, you know, kind of the premier person at their institution. So don't worry too much about that, but you do have to be realistic. You know, surgery is a very competitive specialty, even for people in the States, it is the top tier specialty. So now if you add these other barriers that are out with your control, like you're a foreign medical graduate, like you're not a citizen of the country, obviously that's gonna make things a little bit more challenging. One of the roundabout ways that you could do things if you wished, if you really wanted to get with it and, and you just were not able to get into a surgical residency is saying, I won't do surgery, do something that is related to surgery. Let's say that you do internal medicine for three years. So internal medicine residency is three years long. You do internal medicine residency for three years. And then, you know, the, the, internal medicine can only help you. Like if you're trained as an internal medicine doctor, first of all, you might love it and say, never mind, I'm going to go be a cardiologist. Um, and remember, the surgical specialties, the world is not just medicine and surgery anymore. There's interventional radiology, interventional cardiology, interventional gastroenterology. So there's this huge middle ground of procedures, but not necessarily knife in your hand. And if that's what interests you, there's no reason you can't do internal medicine and then do interventional cardiology. Who's stopping you? You know, so that's a, that's a way to be, get into the surgical profession, to the procedural profession, but not necessarily the classic route of surgery, residency, and onward. Hmm. Um, so, uh, the, the and, and again, when we individually speak, if you guys would like to talk, I can sort of tell you based on your own situation, what would be ideal for you. Um, so in terms of next steps, the big thing is to get familiarize yourself very aggressively with what ERAS requires and the dates. So based on your own um, medical school, when you graduated, there is kind of a cut point. They like medical graduates less than five years out of medical school. That's not to say that people who are more than five years out of medical school don't get residencies. Of course they do. But that is like some sort of arbitrary cut point that they do look at to say, this person may be older. But you know, remember, a lot of us who went to medical school in the British way of going through medical school, basically went to medical school right after high school. Whereas in America, people go to college for four years and then go to medical school. So they're older. So, so you may be, you know, 22 years old and still five years out of medical school, you know, but, and, and that needs to be conveyed and you can talk to people about that. One of the um, best ways around that problem is again, to come to the States and do a sub internship, because then people in the department where you eventually may work, familiarize themselves with you and understand where you're coming from. Because the good news about the US is that there are no rules. There's no law from Congress that says, a foreign medical graduate must be five years, or you know, the only law is the one I told you about the USMLE. So what I mean, the good news about that means that every department can do what it wants at its own discretion. Harvard can hire only medical students from Pakistan. They can choose, they can do whatever they want. It's their prerogative. So if you come and they love you, they'll take you. So that's you know hope. It's not like you're being blocked just by laws or by rules. But at the same time, it is challenging because you have to beat out pretty much everybody else. You really have to be committed. You have to be somebody that is ready to work for no money for a period of time to really prove yourself. It's a lot like becoming an actor. You know, like you have to wait tables and live with six roommates with cockroaches in your house, and one day you'll make it big. And some people don't. But you you have to be you know this. If this is your dream, then this is your dream. Right. So not no better time to go for it than now. Um, it is absolutely doable. And I don't say that in the whole pie in the sky. Oh, follow your dreams. I really mean it is doable. I'm sitting in front of you, living, breathing, telling you it's doable. I was a foreign medical graduate and now I'm I went to Stanford and I went to Harvard. But I am a U.S. citizen. So that is a, a fact. And I did go to medical school in Britain. And so it is important to recognize that that gave me a big advantage, obviously. But still a foreign medical graduate. And I was Stanford's first foreign grad ever in their vascular program. So again, it can be done. It's just a matter of, you know, luck and your perseverance and kind of knowing 
what steps to take because as I told you, you have to be applying a year in advance and you really have to prepare for that application. And everything has to be like, if you come to the day of the application and you missed one piece, you don't have the ECFMG certificate, you cannot apply. Literally, the computer will not let you submit. So there's no way around it. So being aware of what needs to happen, when it needs to happen, is fundamental to being successful because otherwise you're waiting a whole nother year. Okay. And obviously life continues and it's tough to, to keep doing this. So, and you should also be ready to potentially not match. There are many people that don't match the first time, don't match the second time, match the third time. My very good friend, actually, that happened to her when, when we were in Houston. And now she's more than happy. She went to a program to do internal medicine. She wanted to do ob initially. She applied. She didn't match. Then the next year, she applied to ob and she applied to internal medicine. She did not match to ob but she matched to internal medicine. And now she's a very happy endocrinologist living out a great life in DC. But, you know, she wanted to work and live in the States. She was from India and she had done her medical school there. And then she came and she did a little bit of, you know, research work. And that's another great way to break into the system, to come and do like a research rotation with somebody, because there you don't have to touch patients, but you have very close contact with attendings. I myself run an anticoagulation lab at Harvard, and I have a, a currently a, a resident working with me. She, granted, she's from Tufts, which is obviously right down the street, but still the, the concept that, you know, she ultimately wants to do her vascular fellowship here. And so this is a good way for her to break in. And that's a very non-threatening way to, to make yourself very valuable to an attending. If you do research with them, you publish with them. And obviously having publications for your ERAS application looks amazing. So those are the types of things that you want to do to pad your application. But, but the best way, again, to know what you need to do is to look at what the requirements are for ERAS through that link so that you kind of know what the application looks like. And then you know kind of how to structure your life to get prepared to put that application in. So that's all I have. If any of you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, ask questions. There is Hello. A, yes, please continue. Hello. Hi, yes, Dr. Kuldeep. Hello, ma'am. Uh, myself, Dr. Kuldeep. Ma'am, ma I am did my orthopedics from India, ma'am. Uh -huh. uh, uh, actually, I just want to ask, actually, I have a plan to settle in states. I want to come. But uh, as you said, steps are steps are compulsory, mandatory for right. the entrance. Right. It's a pre prerequisite. Requisite. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, ma'am, just want to ask if I choose for a research fellowship, like you said, is uh, that uh, also needs uh, steps or you can apply without that? Oh, great question. So no, you can apply completely without that. In okay. fact, I would advise you um, that you would come and do mm -hmm. the research fellowship and study for the steps simultaneously. While you are there. Very yeah. good. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, that makes the most sense. I will tell you, so so this is one thing I'll tell you, the, the, the orthopedics, neurosurgery, plastic surgery, vascular surgery, and cardiothoracic surgery are highly competitive because there are fewer spots. And so it's not impossible that even though you've done, in fact, I actually have a friend, this guy, Atul, who did orthopedics in Mumbai. Atul Jain, ma'am. Atul Jain, ma'am. Uh, you know, I actually don't know what his last name is. I guess he's not yeah. Atul Jain, ma'am. He's yeah. a spine surgeon, ma'am. He's a spine yeah. surgeon, ma'am. He's a very famous personality, actually. So if you have Oh, no, 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 no. This is somebody else. This okay. is somebody else. This is not a but famous if, person. <laughs> if you, uh, maybe he's famous in uh, among Indians. Uh, you don't know. Yeah, so might be, ma'am. Yeah. So no, he's this guy, uh, this guy finished uh, medical school in Bombay and in Grant and then came immediately to America. Yeah, ma'am. That is Atul, yes. ma'am. That is yeah. Dr. Atul Jain, ma'am. He he's a neuros neuro neurosurgeon, ma'am, I think. Ortho uh, orthopedic spine surgeon, I think. Maybe he was in Bombay. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I don't, he's in California now. Do you have yeah. any contact with him? I do, but Would he never... be able that... to schedule a meeting like this? If you can request, no, because but that, this is that, what definitely, comes, but that's Deep sort of my, my point. Yes. He, he never matched, that's what I'm saying. Oh, he never, he's not oh. a he came oh, to America and he okay, never matched. Okay. It's been 10 years never. and he's not coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, so it's definitely not the same guy. Then no, so, he's not the right person to talk to. No, like, but that's why I'm like, waiting, I think you guys, yeah, unless no. you know something, I don't know. <laughs> no, so no, what no. happened to him is he did his schooling and then he ended up getting married and came. To the US. His wife does engineering and he does, he did orthopedics yeah. and he was fine in India. Things were fine. We, he never actually worked though. I mean, like, you know, he was like two, three years out and so he came quite young, which was a good thing. But then when he came, 
he applied so so to be fair though he had a problem he did his problem was he uh, unfortunately did not do well on one of the steps step things so that's the other thing do not underestimate those step exams you cannot fail them there is one this is USMLE step 2 CS which is basically a mock exam where you physically come and examine patients and that may have now gone away even because of COVID but at the time it was there and the, the problem with that exam is that even though it was a very easy exam where they mock, you, you come to a location and they have 10 actor patients and you go into each room and you like you know they it's an appendicitis or whatever they want you to they want to just see how you do with the patient the problem was that from foreign graduates they use the USMLE step two CS as a way to test if your English is good. So if you fail the exam, even if your English is perfect, they assume it's because your English is bad because the exam is so easy that nobody should fail it. But people okay. don't fail it because people don't fail it because it was difficult. People fail it because in India, for example, versus in the States, when you approach a patient, it is a little bit different. In America, you know, there's a soap note and like just, you know, rhetoric that you know, if you're part of the system here, it's not any, any better or worse, it's just different. And so you have to familiarize yourself with that in order to go for this exam. And this person didn't do that. You know, they were like, I am a doctor, I'm fine, which that was not what the exam was testing. And so unfortunately, that became a knife in his back because once he failed that exam, everyone was like, he doesn't know English. So he never even got an interview. Nobody even checked, you know, it's just, oh, no, failed out. So for orthopedics, no way. So my point is like, you know, take it very seriously. I think doing something where you come over here, you work in like an orthopedic lab and then simultaneously, um, you know, take your steps. That's the smartest way to sort of do it. Um, you might even be able to be funded that way. That way it won't just be money. Oh, hold on, you guys, one second, yeah? Hey, how are you? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so um, that, and and you, you definitely would not need to take your USMLEs in order to do that. So that's not a bad idea. Ma'am, uh, one thing. Yes, sorry, ma'am, sorry. Uh, you go ahead, ma'am. I will ask later. You ask first. Okay. Ma'am, uh, I just want to ask because I have checked uh, so many uh, uh, program directors for the same for the research fellowship and all, but uh, sometimes the main person, the concerned person is not giving the research fellowship. He is providing just a clinical fellowship and the mm -hmm. basic requirement to fill that is the steps only. So yeah. you can't proceed for, forward. And if you uh, mail them individually, they sometimes don't respond. And yeah. uh, uh, they want sometimes you have an idea, but you don't have a draft of that research idea. You don't have a, a proper thing that they select it for research, public research uh, as a research proposal or not. That's a big thing. That's a big hurdle for uh, going ahead. Yeah. Because uh, actually, I am I am about to wind up with my spine. I am doing a spine fellowship here in India, long term spine fellowship. It is going to wind up in February last, next year. So I was planning to come to US for steps uh, for research fellowship in the next year. If I was planning to do that, but uh, I am not getting any opportunity as of now to whom to uh, uh, to whom to approach or how to approach. Actually, I have checked so many uh, program director uh, directors contacts through the internet, but I am not able to find out. No, it's a, that's a very good point, actually. So I'll tell you because I'm on the receiving end of a lot of that. The problem is that, you know, I would say in a week, I probably get, I'd say 15 emails from foreign medical graduates asking for research opportunities. And, you know, it's just impossible. I mean, I always try to write back and say, especially now, especially now with COVID, where a lot of the hospitals have shut down. You know, they won't even allow, Harvard wouldn't even allow their own medical students, the Harvard medical students to come and rotate, let alone somebody foreign. So the problem is you get stuck in a situation where more than ever now, the idea of physically being able to go to a location is sort of dampened. So then the question becomes, well, what do you do then? Like you said, you know, you're stuck in this position where spine fellowship is going to end in February. What, what happens as the next step? I mean, I would say for, for somebody like you, I think the, the most important thing is to say that you would be able to potentially participate in research remotely. So you don't necessarily, because your whole agenda I, here is to make a relationship with whomever the person is that, you know, ideally would give you a job. And so you, and it doesn't have to be necessarily like, let's say you do a research fellowship at Stanford, 
right? Doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to Stanford, but obviously those letters are going to hold a lot of weight for you. But, but if the, if right now there are clinical fellowships that are requiring your steps, right? And you've already made an effort to get research ones and have not been successful, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to just take the steps, right? Like study and take them. You know, you finish your spine fellowship in February, study for the steps over the next six months and take the exams and then apply for a clinical fellowship to come over and be able to actually work with patients. Because if you do that, then you could in theory be hired, you know, moving forward. And what will happen is if you come, let's say you come on a J-1 visa, right? That requires that you need, you need to go back. I'm just assuming you're not a US citizen. You would then be able to do your fellowship, and then they would be telling you, okay, you need to go back now, right? But what happens a lot of times is if they like you and they want to hire you, the place will convert your J visa to an O, and then you get to stay. So, so, and that, I know people like that too. So, but, but this is at least an in, and that's all you need. You just need a door to open for you somewhere. So the research thing is a little bit challenging, especially in this day and age because of the COVID issue. And I can't see, I can't foresee in the next six months that changing. So I think that you might keep hitting dead ends. Um, but if you just say, okay, let's move on. Let's go to the clinical side of things. Maybe you might have better luck for your particular situation um, if you went that route. Uh, thanks, ma'am. Ma I, I am hitting the dead end and blind ends actually right now. Yeah. Uh, actually, I want to do the same as you suggested. Uh, actually, uh, sometime now, actually, ma'am, as you, as you mentioned, orthopedics are very highly... Uh, highly demanding branch in us uh somehow whenever you thought of giving us steps and all somebody tell you uh, nee, it's not possible for a international graduate to get us uh, orthopedics or neurosurgery as well as spine surgery field in states that gives us so much de demotivation to you yourself now that you continue further or not Actually, it's a big step, ma'am, because you are practicing surgeon right now in India and you have to give us steps, which was uh, you have to read from your MBBS time, graduate mm -hmm. time, that is 10 years back. It's very difficult. It's just my thought, actually. No, you're completely right. Well, I'll tell you one thing, okay? I am, my, my mom is from Nagpur and my dad is from Delhi. I have a lot of family in India. One thing I'll tell you about India is that everybody, even the guy, your chaiwala will come and give you their opinion. Your job is to say, none of you people know what you're talking about. I don't care what you think. I'm just going to do it. You shouldn't be, I mean, nobody, nobody is going to come and tell you because they don't know anything. I mean, like they, they, but everyone has a great opinion. You know, even your like aunties, aunties, auntie will be, will have some, <laughs> her feelings that she tries to tell you is just so dumb. You know, like just tell her, go watch ZTV and leave me alone. <laughs> because you should not be in any position to listen to any of these people. There are very few, you know, there are hundreds of people obviously in India that become doctors and all that, uh, there's a decent proportion of them that do want to come abroad. Yes. And, but usually, even though there's a, a handful of people like that, you don't really have much interaction because, you know, you're kind of on your own to your point, especially if you're 10 years practicing, because, you know, everyone's going to be telling you, you're already 10 years in, you're already on this trajectory, you already live in India, you know, here's your wife, here's your child, why are you doing this? Like, everything is fine, what, what is your, but this is your dream, you know, like, I mean, that's that's that. And is it is it difficult to get orthopedics or, and neurosurgery? Oh my God, yes. I would say that, you know, I mean, I don't know this exact statistics, but I would say that probably in all of the orthopedic residents in the country, there might be two or three foreign graduates, might be, okay? But who said you can't be that person? Nobody. Right now, I don't want to be like, oh, do whatever, you know, it's going to be fine. This is not a Hindi movie where everything's going to work out in the end. But at the same time, you know, I think that you have to come into it with a positive attitude, like worst case scenario, you know, and, and don't come at it like long term. Oh, my God, what's going to happen to me in 2023? What's the next step of this process? Take the steps. OK, just take the steps. Once you take those exams, then you have them. Then you can say, OK, what can I do with this? Maybe, maybe this is just a thought, right? Your passion for coming to the States is greater than doing orthopedics. So you might say, okay, I was an orthopedic surgeon. Sure. But I'm getting a general surgery residency. Okay. Then come do general surgery, do five years general surgery, then apply for orthopedics, right? Because that's another roundabout way of doing it. It's all about, you know, getting again through the door, however you come, yeah. even if you come internal medicine, you're an orthopedic. Now you may, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a surgeon. If I was doing medicine, I would be very, I feel very, you know, out of place. But at the same time, like, you know, if I really wanted to go somewhere and that's the way in, then that's the way in, you know? So 
but even then, I mean, don't don't get me wrong. It's not like internal medicine is so easy; everyone's getting it. That's also challenging. But you know, th- there's definitely there's more positions, so therefore it's a little bit easier to achieve. But uh, my advice to you would be twofold: one, don't listen to anybody; just keep it to yourself, do your own thing. Everybody's going to have an opinion in India. Everybody, and the opinion is usually negative. So just don't listen. And number two is, you know, look at other ways. It doesn't need to be the streamlined way. Um, but you know, the next for you, it sounds like the smartest move next would be to continue with your regular life and in parallel take the steps on the side. What's the harm? Worst case, you lose the money taking it. That's it, right? But if you yes, make good, good uh, uh, you know, scores and you can move forward, that's great. Yes, you have another question, Doctor Raisman. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Srivatsa Surya. I'm from India. Uh, actually, I um, I've completed my USMLE all steps, and yeah. I've applied for my first match this year. Uh, my Next. primary aim uh, my primary aim is to get into a plastic surgery residency in USA. Um, <laughs> so I know it's like extremely tough as tough as orthopedic surgery. So. Uh, I did my best. I got an average score, like 230s in step one and two. And this, so I thought my best shot is to go through general surgery and then get into plastic surgery. Okay. So uh, as of now, I have received uh, zero interviews. Like I have not received any interviews at all. And then uh, once again, as uh, previously we've discussed that, uh, you know, all interested graduates send multiple hundreds of emails and you yourself receive 15 emails, no ma'am. So, um, and it's very tough to get a research position in USA. So what I was wondering is, um, is it okay to do a PhD or an MS, which could be more relatable to uh, general surgery? So which will increase chance of matching? You know, so so it depends on, so first of all, master's or PhD in and of itself will not increase your chances unless you're physically doing it in the United States. So let's say you're doing the PhD at Mayo yes. Clinic. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So yeah. Something like that, because then what happens is like, like, let's say you want, you do a PhD in plastics, okay, in plastic surgery, something to do with like tissue rejuvenation, let's pretend, okay, something right. to do with that. And if you do that in a place like Mayo, obviously you will come in contact with plastic surgeons. Those plastic surgeons then write your letters and vouch for you and make you much more likely to potentially match. Let me ask you this. Did you have any rotations um, that you, like who? uh, Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Just just one second. I'm so sorry. Just give me one second, okay? Yeah, all right. That's okay. That's all right. Tell me about a patient. Just one second. Yeah, sure. That's not good. Sorry, guys. Ugh. Yeah. No worries. Hello. Uh, yeah. y- yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, so what uh, what happened was all since all my scores are less, uh, I mean, like average scores, and I tried with multi, uh, like hundreds of emails to Mayo Clinic, Cleveland, Harvard, Stanford, and I got no response at all. So. Um, so that's what I thought to do a PhD or MS in USA because like, uh, because that is, I thought that would be a way to, uh, connect with people there because they, we would at least get a, uh, student visa, F1 visa, and we could come over there and then connect with the department. Uh, so my question is, does PhD, uh, doing a PhD or MS, uh, in USA actually increase chance, uh, like compared to, uh, trying to get into a research assistant, um, and not successful. It, it won't. So, so not in a one-to-one way. So it's not like, oh, you know, he did a PhD. We now want him. In fact, to some extent, it even makes you think, well, why did it? I mean, obviously, you know, this person like, well, I don't know. Oh, he did a PhD to try to get into a residency, but they might say something like, oh, you know, because a PhD is a diff- is a scientist. Right. So that's yeah. not not a doctor. So then the question, well, why did if you, you know, they, you might even get the question, well, why did you do this? You know, what was your the only benefit of doing the PhD potentially is that if things didn't work out, you would have a very strong other degree to fall back on where you could continue living in the States, but you'd be working as a scientist versus working at a like at a drug company or something versus working oh. as a doctor. You know, uh, and that is yes, something sure. that you also have to kind of answer for yourself. You know, what's more important, living in the States, working for Pfizer or living in India, being a plastic surgeon, for example. You know, only you know okay. that. Nobody yes, else can answer that for you. Uh, but 
so I, 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 I do, you know, I do understand what you're saying about sending emails and getting no answer. I mean, honestly, it's, it's truly luck. The more you send out, obviously the statistical probability of someone responding is higher, but then, you know, even the process of finally getting through, it's very tough. Usually they want to know that you're already here. So the people that tend to make it in those sorts of roles, like you're describing are people who like actually like go to Rochester, Minnesota, okay. you know, they're living there and then they, go physically go to Mayo to the plastics department and say, you know, I'm here as a student. I'm, I, I would like to apply for your program. And, you know, then they, they take you seriously to some extent, but that's a big investment for not knowing, you know, it's like I said, it's like being an actor. Like it'd be like going to Bollywood without having any idea what's going to happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> True. So, like, and, and probably just as painful, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. and, yeah, so I mean, it's just, um, I, I think to answer your question, though, honestly, it, it depends on what PhD, what masters where, and um, yeah, that's what I wanted to ask, like, uh, if plastic surgery, um, do you recommend a PhD if, if kind of re uh, relatable to plastic surgery, like PhD in biomedical engineering or something, it could be any PhD or like, just a PhD or something related to the field, so which would, because uh, biomedical you know, I think most, yeah. most PhDs you can twist to fit into some field, you know, like biomedical engineering is kind of the new hot thing because innovation in medicine, regardless of whether it's plastic surgery, vascular surgery, whatever is kind of the new hot thing. So you certainly could do that if, if you could do a, I mean, but uh, um, another option would be to do it in something strictly science, you know, some benchtop research that had to do with, again, in plastics case, rejuvenation or like, you know, angiogenesis or something of that nature that you can probably tie to anything surgical. Right. And then there are other types of PhDs that don't have to do actually with doing any benchtop science, things like health uh, outcomes. You know, there's a whole study now about like database research, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, um, which has thousands and thousands of people. And, and that kind of stuff doesn't require even, you know, much time consumption. Like you, you would like work in a place like Chicago and you'd be really working in an office all day working with big data sets. But, you know, doing a PhD is not a small feat. I mean, you're, you're talking about a three to five year. Three years. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And, and the problem is every year that you are out of medical school hurts you a little bit more. So if you go do a PhD, yeah, that's great. That element may be plus one point, but you'll be minus 10 points because now you're five years out more from medical school than you are now. Yeah, I'm, so, a, I'm already six years out of medical already, school. Yeah, that'll add up another I would three not add eight years. years. I would not add eight years. I would say, you know, the best thing to do is strengthen, like everything that you want to do, you want to do in parallel. Like don't, so, so go ahead and let, let's pretend that you, you know, look at Hopkins, for example, Johns Hopkins has a yeah. number of online uh, options for a master's degree, right? One to yeah, two years yes. master's degree, even a master's in public health, something like that, right? It oh, just gives you. you a stamp on your butt that says something American. When somebody looks at your CV, they're, oh, he went to Hopkins, right? Oh, for right. what? Who cares? <laughs> so, oh, that's, that's true. It, Hopkins has a, an MPH, so master's in public health. Again, two years, pretty much all online, except for like a few days that you need to come do some interaction, which is great. You could physically come here. And then in those days when you're here, you can go actually to, to Hopkins and try to meet somebody who's there to see if you can get, you know, further connections and then um, build that way. Instead of thinking, okay, I'm going to do the PhD, then I'm going to apply, then I'm going to do. And this situation you described where you applied and you didn't get an interview. That's very common. The, the, I hope you applied for a lot of preliminary positions as well. Yes, just, yes, a lot of but, preliminary positions and uh, categorical, <laughs> both. And categorical. Unfortunately, yeah. Right. No, no, that's okay. It happens. That is completely normal, right? It's it's very rare to just happen on the first try. So you know, things that you can do to strengthen your application would be getting more publications. And really, I think the big thing, the, the people that I've seen who ultimately do manage to sneak in are people that do have some connection to. The states as in like i said like a degree from hopkins or you know the they worked in somebody's research lab for four years in whatever yeah. yale whatever because there is i don't know they, they just like kind of want that i've never met actually somebody who's just okay, oh yeah i just matched from india i've never been to the states i just yeah. you know it's very rare those days yeah, that's are why i was uh thinking that uh maybe not a phd let's say uh, like you have suggested the mph or an ms in usa like a two years yeah. commitment that yeah. would give me a chance to connect to uh, the surgeons. Maybe they will know me in person than knowing from India. Right. That's why I was asking, uh, like, that would be a better option, right? In case if 
uh, no mails. There since there is no returning of mails. At least I could get a student visa and uh, come to yeah. USA and do connections. Yeah. Yes, and then uh, while you're here, you would do a rotate. Like you know, you could even just go to your local hospital, whatever it may be. You know, even like you, you know, we're using words like Stanford, Harvard, this and that, but there are hundreds of thousands of places. And you, you know, you could go to the local community hospital and you make friends with the plastic surgeon there, or you and I can help you maneuver that when you come, so that you can do that in parallel with doing your master's. That way, yeah. when it comes to, and then you apply. Like, don't don't miss the opportunity to apply next year. You apply again with the match. You know, yeah. I think that this time you have something to talk about, and you know, in your personal statement, you'll talk about it and whatnot. So, I think that that's the the best way to go. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Another option that I can think of that if you contact Canada and you get your qualification evaluated by them, you'll get the equivalent. And then uh, through Canada, you can move to USA. Like if you get the equivalent, yeah. then because Royal College of Canada, I think they accept MRCS. Oh, the, oh thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah. I, I haven't thought about that. Think, uh, think. <laughs> open. That's why, because I. Yes get to talk to like 20,000 plus people every now and then. So what I understand uh, to get into states is little tough because of this uh, political issue of USMLE. But then if you can get your equivalent through Canada, uh, Canadian, yeah, and then uh, United States, they are kind of, they accept and regard each other. So if they accept and they give you equivalents and then you can maybe try and stay, yeah. And oh. this was Dr. Khawar, he asked for MRCS. So contact Royal College of Canada, Canadians, and then see how they regard. Uh, I think they accept MRCS because I've been in contact oh. with them uh -huh. and I was thinking of offering some scholarships or some fellowships through them. So that's why I have a little bit idea. Yeah. Thank you very much, ma'am. So I, I'll definitely try this. Try uh, both. And then, a uh, one, PhD in USA is not clinical. Remember all this. Uh, if <laughs> yes, you do PhD true, in um, USA, you cannot get into clinicals. But while you're in, while you're doing PhD in states, you'll have the access to uh, attend because then they offer these USMLEs that um, they have academies and these uh, to tutor opportunities where you can uh, go and with the help of them, you can learn, yes, uh, and you can prepare for USMLE and then you can give. Because oh, once you have right. already forgotten after six years or five years, then all right, you cannot recall as much as a medical student does. So right. with that way, Absolutely. you can help get the help from the locals. And then like Dr. Dua said, you can contact them personally as well. So these are the things, but then what option she has given you, like you can do MBA or MPH, like she said. Uh, I've seen many consultants, uh, many surgeon consultants who have done MBA or MPH in the past, like just to get the administrative positions as well. So that helps, but not PhD. Uh, PhD is only clinical in Europe, not in USA, not even oh, in Canada. Oh, thank you it very much. Mind, yes. <laughs> I was actually at the brink of uh, applying for a PhD. If I hadn't come now, I would have actually applied, uh, wasted three to four years. So it's a good thing that uh, <laughs> then you, you can wasted. <laughs> you continue the rest of your life with teaching, but uh, or pharmaceuticals, like she said, you cannot get into clinicals. Then uh, no one would consider you for clinicals. Yeah, true, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very but much. But try Canada, and then ah, you yes. can. You, then you can maybe move to the United States after doing the uh, preliminary work there and then maybe so. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll definitely try this route. Uh, th yeah. Thank you very much, ma'am. Even Dr. Kuldeep and Dr. Fava, yes. They can try, you know. You can't, like, you don't expect someone so much qualified to go in the right direction of the nose. Try here and there and then go where your goal is. Always keep the goal in your focus. But try here and there and then reach there. Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, you have to go now. You're muted. Yes. Thank Sorry? you so much. Oh, you can you muted. hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you yes. so much. No yes. problem. For no problem at all. It was lovely and... to meet all of you. Just give, give them my uh, contact information. And then Could after I? that, all right. need I'll, give you, I'll give it to them in the chat. So they can't say yeah. I haven't given it to them. Yeah. I but remember, this... you can, uh, yes, 
Oh, right here. You have sent me privately. Oops, it didn't go through. One second. No. Oh, it didn't go yeah, through everyone. That patient because they're. Yes. You heard they're harassing. Yes. There you go. Yes. All right. Well, nice to meet all of you. If you need anything, thank you so much. Me. Anytime. That was a thank, pleasure. Thank you. Yes, it was a pleasure meeting you and talking to you. It, you gave us more than one hour, so thank you. <laughs> that that's it for today. I'll send you all my bill. <laughs> <laughs> Do so. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll invite you to Sweden once again. Yeah, that'll EBTM. be great. For another EBTF. Yeah? Next Come. year. Thank you. Thank yes. You. My Thank pleasure. You. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. bye. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye bye.